Okay, so I wanted to illustrate one thing that is an important distinction between linear motion and rotational motion quantities. And just for a reminder, we have our angular displacement, our angular <clears throat> velocity, and our angular acceleration over here. And I'm going to add a, another ball to our string, right? So we have, if you imagine whirling a string that has a ball, say, number one, right here, and ball number two, right here. And they start down at uh, this position, okay? So initial. And they end up at this position at the little snippet of time that we're looking at during it whirling around in a circle. And I think if you looked at that, you would agree that both of those balls on a tether have traced out the same delta theta during that little snippet of time that we're considering where they go from initial to final, right? If you look at ball number one in isolation, right, if ball number two wasn't even there, you would have uh, the string tracing out that angle. And ball number two also, since it's attached to the same string, traces out that same angle. And so the angular displacement is the same for both balls. Okay. That's interesting. Okay. However, I think you would also agree that the distance covered by each one of these balls is very different. So ball number two goes along this distance. If you were to measure that out with a tape measure, it would be significantly longer than the distance covered by ball number one. Okay? So if we put that in uh, our diagram a little more formally here, so we call uh, ball number two's displacement, okay, delta S2, and ball number one's displacement, delta S1. Delta S1, by the way, has the same uh, equation form, okay, just dependent on how far it is away from the center versus how far number two is away from the center, okay? But you'd agree that because R1 is considerably smaller than R2, the arc length covered by the first ball is considerably smaller than the arc length covered by 2. Okay? Even though, as we've already discussed, the angular displacement of each of those things is exactly the same. Okay? Now this... This relationship where if you have a greater distance from the axis of rotation, the axis of rotation being a line that would run through this point and come up out of the screen at you and go down into the screen, right? So the this would be, um, <clears throat> if it were a wheel, it would be kind of like the axle that was holding the wheel in place. That would be the axis of rotation for the wheel. That distance from the axis of rotation is directly proportional to the linear distance that these things are covering, even though the angular uh, distance, quote-unquote, that they're covering is the same, okay? So that's a particular difference between angular quantities and linear quantities when you're talking about objects moving in a circle, okay? The linear quantities can vary significantly depending on whether you're talking about ball number one, one, ball number two, or any little bit of mass that's part of a rotating object, right? And if you were to step through that logic for angular velocity and <coughs> angular acceleration, well, you'd get a similar result, right? Because if delta theta is the same for each one, and delta t, of course, is the same for each one. Well, then their rotational or angular velocity must also be the same. And also, if you were, for instance, had a wheel and you were, you know, pedaling on your bike and you were accelerating that wheel, right, you were covering more and more angular displacement every moment that went by, 
so changing your angular velocity significantly, well, then delta omega would be the same for both balls or both bits of mass within a wheel. And delta t, of course, would be the same as well. So again, okay, for all three of these things, all the same. Okay. Even though they can, the, the linear quantities corresponding to them, right? So for example, the, the linear velocity of ball number one is going to be significantly smaller than the linear velocity of ball number two, okay? Because you're simply covering less ground in the same amount of time, okay? or covering less distance in the same amount of time. And yet the angular quantities are quite different. Okay? That's an important thing to remember. Technically, it only applies okay, when you have a rigid, quote unquote, object. So here it's rigid because the string is taut. Um, the example of like a bicycle tire, it would be rigid because of all the spokes and being made out of steel, everything like that. Uh, if you were to have something that was rotating but also was partially fluid, like, I don't know, like the sun is a good example, right? The sun is a big hot ball of plasma um, there at the center of our solar system. And so things would move differently, potentially, at differently different angular velocities and accelerations for an object that was in some way fluid. In other words, not rigid, not a solid object. Now we're only going to consider rigid objects, but it's important to know when these kind of rules that all these angular quantities have to be the same for any bit of mass in any rotating object, it's important to know when that rule breaks down. And uh, that's, that's the edge case for us here, okay? So that little side note on rotational quantities or angular quantities versus their linear counterparts. And next time we'll move on to some more rotating objects and perhaps an example using some of the equations that we've learned. See you then.